for attending. I'm, you know who I am, Heather Arnold, local history librarian here at Casey Dinny Libraries. So today we're looking at the history of the area, acrostic history with Happy New Year. So I'm going to just share my screen. So we're going to do Happy New Year today. So nearly only two weeks to go and we'll have a Happy New Year. So H is for hospitals. So um, from the 1860s, many town, local towns had small private hospitals often run by experienced nurses. And for anything more complicated, if you survived the journey, you could attend one of the large public hospitals in Melbourne. So I came across this account from um, October 1884 about the death of a young boy, Edward Williams of Tynong, and he died after having been bitten by a snake. He would put his hand into a hollow log in which he thought a native cat, which is a quoll, lay concealed, only to find that it can actually contained a four foot long tiger snake. This yeah. happened at eight o'clock in the morning and shortly afterwards, um, Edward began to feel the deadly effects of the poison and his father, alarmed at the lad's appearance, hurried him to the railway station and took him to the Alfred Hospital. From Tynong, you can imagine that, the boy was quite insensible when admitted and about 2 p.m. at, at about 2 p.m., so that's um, uh, six, eight hours after the snake, the snake bite, mm. And he was evidently dying. He expired very shortly after admission. So that is a very sad case, but just tells you about the um, 1884, the lack of um, hospitals and medical care that would have been you know, down in this area. So um, from the 1909, there was a bush, the bush, the bush nurse and hospital movement, and it was it was developed to provide uh, medical services to those in the bush. And um, the local community had to raise the money to fund the costs of a nurse's salary and her board, her uniform and a means of locomotion. The salary was set by the Bush Nursing Association at the rate of around 80 pounds per annum, which is a rate of pay for a hospital nurse with five or six years experience. And the first, um, first Victorian nurse was appointed to Beach Forest in March, 1911. And the early example in this area was at Kirirup, when Nurse Homewood started work in the Bush Nursing Centre in July 1918. Um, the hospital was later replaced by the Soldiers Memorial Hospital, which is what this photograph here is. This hospital was built about 1922. And then later on, um, the Soldiers Memorial Hospital became the Western Port Memorial Hospital, which was in uh, Rossiter Road. And there's a Bush Nursing Hospital at Pakenham, which was opened on um, February 1928. And a bush nursing hospital, which opened in Berwick in March 1940, so quite a lot later than the than the original ones. So it's just an interesting part of our history, and and you can imagine for the nurses, I mean they're quite experienced, but how um, I mean Kurup was at least a bit of a town with a railway station, but how isolating it must have been for these nurses to be the only uh, medical help for for miles and miles around, and what the whole range of um whole range of um cases they must have had they would have had maternity cases and and you know snake bites and the odd bit of stitching up when your finger you know cuts and bruises and, and and nursing people who were sick with the flu so it would have been a very interesting and a um a very interesting sort of experience for these women so that's h is for hospitals a is for the arts so Emerald itself, so the town of Emerald, which is, you know, as you know, in the hills there, has attracted many writers over the years, including Catherine Susanna Pritchard, Vance Palmer and Nettie Palmer. Janet, um, Nettie Palmer and her husband Vance lived in Emerald with Catherine Susanna Pritchard in 1915 to 1917, and then later on uh, Vance went to the war, and then later on after the war from 1919 to 1925, and she... Um, Believed in the Nettie Vance believed in the importance of the bush and in cultivating an appreciation of the land. But she's more she's interesting because prior to the outbreak of World War II, she became heavily involved in the fight against fascism, and she lived in Spain in 1936 with her family and was a member of the Spanish Relief Committee and the Joint Spanish Aid Council. And she was also the editor of a Sydney anti-fascist journal for women a member of the Victorian branch of the International Refugee Emergency Committee, and she taught English to migrants. So she was quite a, um, not only a, a talented writer, but quite a, um, you know, interesting sort of, had an interesting life as well. So 
I don't have a photo of her, but I have a photo of Mrs. Jeannie Gunn. And she, you may know the book, Where the Never Never. It became, it was quite a famous book. And she, uh, it was made into a television, movie on a television series. So Mrs. Jeannie Gunn, or as she was called, as you can see from the cover of the book, Mrs. Anais Gunn, because that was her husband's name. They were, they were um, Scottish. Uh, Anais Gunn and his brother, Anais Gunn's brother, Robert, had a um, property in the area. So Gunn's Road in um, Hallam. Uh, was named after the family. Uh, so Robert Gunn was an auctioneer and a stocks agent in the area. And Robert Gunn and his brother Anais, their father was a, Peter, his name was, was a Presbyterian minister. And he was at the um, Campbellfield Presbyterian Church. If you ever know, they're sort of on the Sydney road. It's surrounded by um, factories at the moment but it's an old bluestone church with his own cemetery so that's quite an interesting thing so that was the original church that um their father Anais Gunn and Robert Gunn's father had anyway so Anais Gunn was married to Mrs Jeannie Gunn and there's a romantic story behind the way they met so Jeannie Gunn was staying with her friends in oh Jeannie Taylor she was staying with her friends in Nary Warren and driving into the township to attend a concert one night their horses in the buggy became restless. Jeannie suggested that she climb down and hold their heads. She was about to take the last step over the wheel and the horses suddenly backed and Jeannie was thrown into the arms of a man who had gallantly rushed forward to assist. That man was Anais Gunn, who, having had a woman thrown at him in such a manner, felt it was his duty to hold on to her. He was quoted as saying. They married in 1901 and moved to Elsie Station on the Roper River in the Northern Territory. But unfortunately, their married life was cut short by the death of Anais in March 1903. Mm -hmm. But she still wrote uh, Where the Never Never and a few other books from her time up there. She then moved back to Monbolk and was involved with the um, Monbolk RSL and the Monbolk War Memorial. So she's an interesting woman. But she's um, the, the trip to uh, Where the Never Never, like up to Northern Territory at the time, it just took months and months and months. So it must have been a bit of a shock for a, a, um, a woman from Melbourne to actually end up in the in the outback up there so that's mrs Jeannie gunn and her romantic story uh jesse trail of course you can't look at this area without looking at the history of jesse trail she had a um she lived in harkaway she was a, a, an artist and an etcher some of her one a very quite a good etcher that's one of her etchings here Harfra, which is her um her house at harkaway and her and her sister um uh elsie purchased uh, this property in 1913 and uh, Jessie lived there until her death in 1967. Uh, there's, there's just been a new biography of her published called Jessie Child, of course. So she's had a bit more publicity than what she had, but, you know, I, I quite quite like her work and she was, she was one of the early women etchers. Also, of course, in this area, you'd know about the Boyds. This is the Grange at Harkaway, which was built in, demolished in 1960, around 1967, and it was built by the Honourable William Arthur Callender at Beckett, MLC JP, and around 1862, um, it actually had, it's, it's off of Beckett Road, was off of Beckett Road, but it was originally off Hellier Road, and it had views right, right over Western Port. You can just imagine from the, from the hill up there in Harkaway, in a Beckett Road, what amazing views it must have had. Um, so William and Beckett married Emma Mills and they, one of their daughters was Emma Minnie Beckett who married Arthur Merrick Boyd. And then, um, so they lived in the house, they painted in the house. There's photographs, there's a painting that Emma Minnie Boyd did actually inside the Grange, a lovely romantic shot. And um, their son Arthur, then their son, their son Martin Beckett was the, was the author. And his nephew, Arthur Boyd, um, also lived in the house at one time. And Arthur Boyd painted murals in the house. But it's a sad thing that this house, it was the house was then sold to a quarry and it was eventually demolished in, uh, as I said, around um, 1967-68. And it seems a shame that um, given, given its connection to such prominent people, the, the Boyds and the Beckett's, that it wasn't kept, but that's what happened um there was uh murals that were painted in the house Arthur Boyd painted murals in the house um at one stage and those murals have been removed and they're in the National Gallery of Canberra so as I said it was an amazing house but my favorite 
A is for Arts, is Elizabeth Parsons. So we, I only came across her this year uh, and she did a lot of work. She lived in St Kilda, did a lot of work in St Kilda, but she um, they had a holiday house that they took some for a few years in Berwick. And this is Elizabeth Parsons at Wilson Lane in Berwick. It's just such a beautiful shot. And there's other um, other photographs, that, other, other photographs, other artwork, sketches and paintings that she also did in Berwick. She was a professional artist who... Um, as I said, mainly, mainly worked, if you look at the State Library of Victoria and look her up, she, there's a lot of work, uh, works done in St Kilda. And she, um, but, and she, she, and because she lived in Berwick, she also had an association with Emma Minnie Boyd because, of course, the Boyds only lived in Harkaway, so they were neighbours. Um, so not only was Elizabeth a very talented artist and, and an, an underrated artist, I think, as if I'm an art historian, but, you know, <laughs> I just love her work. Um, she, um, she, she, married George who was a surveyor and he had two young sons and then married married in 1868 came to Victoria in um, 1870 and by then she'd already had her own daughter and then she went on to have four more sons so there was a household of five of her own children plus her two stepchildren that, that grew up with the household so she not only had time to be an artist and be involved in all the artistic movements of the time but she was also a mother to seven children so you have to admire her for that as well. And she died um, in um, oh, 1897. So she was only 60, 68 when she died. But she's, she's got a wonderful lot of work that she's left behind. So that's Wilson Lane in Berwick. So we go from the arts to P is for the Princess Highway and other roads. So the Princess Highway was originally known as the Gippsland Road but changed its name in 1920 after a visit of Edward, the Prince of Wales, who later became Edward VIII, the, you know, the Duke of um, Windsor. Um, and the South Gippsland Road was also known as the, which is the South Gippsland Highway, was also known as the Western Port Road or sometimes the Grantville Road. But um, it's interesting that um, before, before, train, before we had trains and motor cars, the only way to get anywhere, of course, was, was to get on a coach. And this was a timetable of coaches. So from, if you went from Dandenong to Lang Lang or Dandenong to Bunyip, for instance, the journey, both those trips are about uh, 50 kilometres or 30 miles. And it would have taken you about four hours by coach. A Cobb and Co coach, which was considered to be relatively fast and relatively comfortable because it had a suspension system made of leather straps, it still took, um, they still only travelled about six, eight miles per hour. So a 30 mile journey is something like four hours, four to five hours <coughs> to go from Danny Nong to Lang Lang. You can't imagine that now, but this is a timetable here from 1877 that will leave Danny Nong at 10.30, get to Cranbourne at 12, get to Tobin Yalek, which is, young, uh, which is um, where Lang Lang is now at three o'clock. So <laughs> 10.30 till three o'clock from Danny Nong to Tobin Yalek. You would of course, had a bit of a stop at the way because they had to um the horses needed to be swapped every 10 to 30 miles so um that that trip from um from Dandenong to Lang Lang would have in, would have ensured um three changes of at least two or three changes of horses to get to get all that way and they did all this and at of course pubs or hotels so before I go there there we go. That's the Princess Highway. I love this photo. 1900. That's what it used to look like. And this is the site, if you haven't seen this photo before, the site of Fountain Gate Shopping Centre. It just blows me away. This here, mm. if you can see with the mouse where I'm indicating, is um, Holly Green, the place, owned, the farm owned by um, Sydney Webb. And, uh, and the garden the gardens behind it are still there now. If you know where the McDonald's is on the highway, at or where Savers is at Fountain Gate Shopping Centre, sort of just next to the Fountain Gate, there's um, brick and gardens, and they're the gardens that Sydney Webb planted. So that is the Princess Highway 1900. And this is another good photo. This is the Princess Highway Beaconsfield in 1931. This here is the uh, uh, Cadinia Creek, and that's the um, what they call now the Central Hotel was originally the Gippsland Hotel and now it's a Central Hotel. So that's Beaconsfield. 
1931. So Aldi must be about here where that tree is. Mm. So it's um, wow. It's a great photo. Uh, mm. You can't you can't imagine it now, but this is what that's the way what we used to look like. This is a lovely photo. So that's yep. the roads. But as I said, all the coaches that went from um, anywhere all throughout Victoria had to stop every um, every. 10 to 30 miles, depending on what the horses were like, to refresh to refresh both uh, the people on the coach and also the um, the horses. And so a whole range of hotels <coughs> um, sprung up, as you would know, in any area. In fact, um, I talked last week about some of the first buildings ever in a, in a town was always a church, but they were often also a hotel. And, you know, of course, the hotels were needed for... Um, Refreshment, accommodation, and the coach stops. So one of the oldest buildings in the region is the Berwick Inn, or also called the Border Hotel, which was established by um, Robert Bain in 1857. The earliest part is 1857. So this picture here is, is 1858. That's Lowell Road, you can see here behind the hotel. And this here is um, what is now the Princess Highway. <laughs> Uh, it's just amazing. That's the old post office here. And and you can actually see if you could blow the photo up, there's a few people outside the um the building. So um it's just an amazing view of Berwick in, in the olden day, in the olden days in 1858, which I can't even begin to think how many years ago. That is a lot of years. <laughs> so that was the original hotel. It was then added on the 18 um 70s and 1880s, the, the two-story sections were added on. But that's the first hotel, not the first hotel in the area, but the oldest and still in existence hotel. There were other um, hotels established. So this is La Trobe Inn on the Tumac Creek, established or called, called the Burke, Burke's Hotel for the very reason that Burke's established it. So that was established um, by Michael and Kitty Burke in 1850. It's actually earlier than the Berwick Hotel, but... Um, you know, obviously the building had um, grown over the years and they operated the hotel from uh, the 1850s until, oh, well, her husband died and then she, her and her daughter operated, operated after that. So um, there's, I believe the, the chimney or something that still remains, there's very little of this building that still remains and the whole thing's been renovated. But some people say one of the original chimneys, chimneys still exists in the, in the new building, but I'm not really sure. Whereas the uh, Berwick Hotel, a lot, of that, a lot of that building still remains. And this is, of course, the, um, the Mornington Hotel, uh, which was established by Thomas and Eliza Gooch in about 1860. That's in Cranbourne. So the Mornington Hotel was on the side of where Kelly's Hotel is now, if you know Kelly's Hotel in, Cran in Cranbourne. The, the Kelly's building was built about, um, uh, I think it was 1928. <coughs> but this building here was established in the 19, 1860s by as is Thomas and Eliza. They've got a romantic story as well because Thomas and Eliza were coming, I think it was in uh, 1854, were coming to, um, to Melbourne. Uh, Thomas uh, was a, an American and he was a sailor. The boat was a Sacramento. And then it was wrecked off Port Phillip Heads. But... Everyone survived. All their luggage was lost. Everyone survived. And Thomas and Eliza, she was a passenger. They met, they fell in love on the boat and they moved to Cranbourne and opened the Mornington Hotel. So, you know, I just think that's a romantic story. She then went on to have something like eight children in 13 years or something, which is even more remarkable. <laughs> even more <laughs> remarkable, I think. But um, anyway, so that's the Mornington Hotel. Um, and this is just another shot. Uh, this is the Limerick Arms. Limerick Arms Hotel was established by um, Daniel and Bridget O'Brien from about 1857. And that was um, somewhere between Narnagoon. Oh, Neil, just on the highway at Narnagoon. So that's the, um, their family. But there was, there was a whole, there was another hotel between Pakenham and Nanagoo in the halfway hotel. There's a whole range of hotels, of course, you know, because we needed, they needed more hotels in those days. And when you consider that people such as commercial travellers would have stayed in the local hotel and, and no one had cars, so they got on a train, they had to sort of stay somewhere. And, you know, it just took so much 
more time to get anywhere. The hotels were not only were, had a lot, you know, they had to have accommodation as well. So that's a Limerick hotel. And I'm always surprised at the number of women from the 1850s who ran hotels and some in their own right and some who operated them with their husbands. So uh, when we looked at um, the, the Border Hotel, we'll go back to that, that was operated by, um, started by Robert Bain. And when he died, um, I think it's about 1887, his wife, Susan Bain, took over the running of the hotel. And she then ran the hotel till 1908 um, or 1907 when she died on her own. And at the same time, she, like, she'd had 10, 12 children. And, uh, and when, when her husband died, the youngest was only seven or eight. So she raised all these children and, and, and ran the hotel with her husband. And then afterwards, you know, after her husband died, she, she ran the hotel without him. So she was just remarkable. The same with the Latrobe Inn. But after Michael um, Burke died, Kitty Burke ran the hotel on her own with her daughter. The same. And, and with the Mornington Hotel, they run it as a partnership, Elizabeth and Thomas Gooch. So it's... Um, Anyway, so I always admire these women who ran these hotels. But so it was a very equal opportunity um, occupation, especially when women were restricted from other occupations. So when you consider that free education came into Victoria in 1872, and I'm pretty sure before that, that um, if you're on a limited budget, you would have sent your boys to school if you had to pay, but not your girls. And even if you did, even if girls were given an opportunity, um, an education. They couldn't go to university till 1881. Melbourne University didn't accept women till 1881. And if they were employed, of course, they were paid less than men because equal pay didn't come in until 1972. So for instance, in 1915, men who worked in the textile industry earned five pounds per week and women half of that. So for all these reasons, it's not surprising that women would become small business owners and operate a hotel. And of course, the other thing about a hotel is that it provided them with living quarters and, so, and employment. So both employment and housing were, were both covered by owning a hotel. It was hard work, but women worked hard anyway. So at least they had their own business and they had somewhere to live while they raised their family. So they're quite an interesting part. There's um, the earliest, uh, another early hotel, I'll just quickly tell you this, was, um, which I haven't got a photo of, I've got very little information, where um, Foundergate Shopping Centre was in 1855, a, um, the Mornington Ho another Mornington Hotel. It was called the Mornington Hotel because we're part of the, uh, county of Mornington. So for land administration purposes, Victoria is divided up into counties and this area is, is the county of Mornington. So it was a Mornington hotel for that, called that at Cranbourne and there was this one at Narry Warren and it was established around 18, um, 18, ooh, 1855, I think, by um, John Gardner on the corner of... Um, Mary Warren North Road and the Gibson Highway and the, and the South Gibson and the, the um, Princess Highway. So I'm always trying to find more information about that and will one day. But anyway, so anyway, lots of hotels in the area and lots of them run by women, which I think is amazing. Now, why? <laughs> why is for, I had to stretch this. I had to tell you, it was hard to get a why. I got two whys. A why is for yachts, yawls and other boats or the fishing industry <laughs> so you know good job uh, good job yeah. so um so the fishing industry this is Sawtells Inlet in uh Turidan. so Sawtells Inlet is the if you know Turidan at all that's the main that's a uh if you see this here that's Foreshore Road what they call Foreshore Road and this here is the fisherman's cottage which was built around 1872 and it's see it's now um a museum run by the Cranbourne Shire Historical Society. So some of the early settlers in Turidan were fishermen. And a lot of them had actually come from Hastings. So Hastings was a big fishing port, or a you know, relatively large fishing port. And then from the 1870s, they moved across to Turidan. 
And the earliest settlers are Jimmy Miles and then the Kernots, Henry and Elizabeth Kernot came over from Hastings in the 1870s. And the Kernots had, um, there's still Kernots in the, in the area. They had 11 children, including Isabella, who married a pool. And of course, the pools are another early family from the area. And it was Elizabeth Pool, Isabella Pool, sorry, that um, owned Fisherman's Cottage from 1910 to 1949. So there used to be uh, other, and you can still see on the foreshore, a few other of the cottages you could tell were the old original fishermen's cottages um you can still see them on the foreshore at Turidan. but um this one here is one of the last remaining remaining examples it, it's relatively intact it's quite uh, it's got one in fact the um two rooms at the front two rooms yeah so it's actually virtually intact and there's no additions at all to it so we're very lucky to have that sort of building in the area um so the last professional fisherman Henry Kernow and Arthur Johnson, whose mother was a Kernop, uh, they surrendered their licence in 1999. So Turin now is still a big fishing area, but it's just recreational fishermen. And people use, people go out um, all the time from Turin to catch a few fish, hopefully, in Western Port Bay. But the days of the commercial fishermen at Turin are long gone. And this is just another boat. This is um, Oliver Colvin, Pompey Colvin. Uh, he came from Curia Up, and Colvins are... Um, a old Kuru up name. They, he, their father, his father was a builder, and um, there's lots of you know connections to Colvins in the area. And this is uh, his boat here, the Petrobus. He was another another fisherman, and he, this is taken at Turidan as well. So, so that's my why. Why is for yachts and yawls and other boats? <laughs> N. N is for nature. So not only was Western Port Bay important for fishing, both amateur and commercial, but it's also an important nature conservation area. Now, if you know Western Port Bay, you know it's very tidal, you know it's a lot of mud flats. So, um, but it is also a significant place for migratory seabirds. The Department of Environment uh, says this about Western Port Bay. In 1982, a large portion of Western Port was designated as a wetland of international importance under the Convention of Wetlands of International Import uh, uh, and under the under the uh, Ramsar Convention. The site occupies nearly sixty thousand hectares and consists of large, shallow, intertidal areas dissected with deeper channels and a narrow strip of adjacent coastline in some areas. So it is clearly important for. Um, uh, Western for weight for migratory birds and um, and, and and other um, like sea sea um, um, sea creatures as well. So we're very lucky to have Western Port there. Even though we used to go swimming at Turin when we were young, this is a story from the olden days here, the sixties. <laughs> How much you know, if we knew Turin then it was very mangrovey and uh, lots of mangroves and quite tidal. It wasn't actually a really great beach, but. Clearly, it was a good place for nature. It just wasn't so great for swimming. Lang Lang's the same. I mean, the other beach at Lang Lang is also very, um, very tidal and very mud flatty. But anyway, good for nature. Not so good for swimming. Um, now, one of my favourite blog posts I've ever done, I do a blog called uh, Casey Gardinia, links to our past. One of my favourite blog, this is still with nature. My favourite post is on, oh, Arcuate Ridge. And an Arcuate Ridge is a curved sand ridge, which are the remains of the walls of ancient lake beds. So this is a town of Cadinia, and you can see this ridge here. You can see this here. Yeah. So that here is, um, uh, that's Delmore Road, and then that's uh, Cadinia Road that goes to Pakenham. That's the Cadinia Primary School. That's a footy ground. And this is Bellardo Road. So this is, uh, goes to um, Cranbourne at the top of the picture and it goes down from, comes down from the Kura up Pakenham Road. So this is, this is the township of Cadinia. You can see it quite clear. I love aerial photos. If you follow Case Cadinia Facebook page, Case Cadinia Heritage, I was looking back over the last few posts. I thought, oh, aerial photo, aerial photo, aerial photo. I just <laughs> love aerial photos. Like, I just, I just love them. And, and the reason I love them is because it shows you what the landscape was like and which you can't see from the road, but you can just see 
you can just see this this ridge, a sand ridge, and we're, what it would have looked like thousands of years ago. It's just an amazing thing. So there's this amazing. Kidini. I know, I know, and you and you only see it from from a from an aerial photo. Mm. But the other thing is, this is uh, another one. So this is again Bellardo Road. This is Hobson's Road, and there's another sandwich at um like a Pakenham South or Rithdale, we might call this. And it's just um that's a trotting track, but like it's just you can clearly see it. But um Jenny Bremner, who works here. She grew up at um, Cadinia and her and she said once to me, oh, you know, Dad used to go walk into Pakenham from Cadinia to Pakenham along the Sand Ridge in Hobson's Road. I thought, what? And I think that's where I first heard about it. And then I saw it on this, um, like I saw it on, on this map and I think, oh, my goodness, you know, like I, I just had no idea they existed. But luckily that's the Sand Ridge here, an accurate ridge. Anyway, I just love it. Just love it. So that is, oh, and haven't quite finished nature. Of course, you can't look at nature in this area without looking at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Cranbourne. That's just, you know, that's an amazing, re- having said that, I've never actually been here there. And I should really remedy that because it's just yes. such a, it's got so much remnant bushland. It's just such a, um, you know, you can see the importance it would have been to the area, to the Indigenous people. Like it's just an amazing resource that we have right on our doorstep. And um, I should go there. So it's not only this remnant bushland that has been preserved, thank heavens, has been preserved, but it's also got the um, the Australian gardens, which showcases um, Australian flora, flora, flora. So um, one of the girls that works here, she does um, bush story time with her uh, ivy, with her um, the indigenous community here, and then she says, oh, you know, we go to the Cranbourne Gardens, and she said, yeah, we saw a snake. And then we saw a wallaby, we saw a wombat, we saw this, we saw that. And like, it's a really great place to introduce children to nature because it's just, you know, an amazing, an amazing, you know, we're talking about the lungs of the city. We're just lucky to have this green space in mm-hmm. the area. Yeah. Now, N, new, N is for nature. E, E is for emergencies. So, um, floods and bushfires have been part of the community since European settlement. Well, clearly before that as well. But um, and the most devastating bushfire in the area, you know, would be Ash Wednesday fires, which were on February the sixteenth, nineteen eighty-three. So they, we've got a series of photographs in the archive, and they're taken by the Shire of Pakenham, uh, just after the fires went through, and just sort of showing the aftermath and the cleanup. Um, you know. Many, many lives are lost and, and, and it's just and hundreds of buildings were destroyed and in the in Upper Beaconsfield and Cockatoo and, of course, other areas and also in South Australia. It was just a devastating loss of life and loss of property. And it, and it tells you the, um, the fact that the communities have recovered, that, that the testament to the locals, that, that their, their hope and strength has overcome this adversity. And then, of course, it is the 2009 fires which affected a little bit of this region. But I remember after 2009 fires, it, um, you know, they were just awful as well. The, the people in Cockatoo were, were talking to on the media and saying, well, we have survived and you can survive. And I, I just think that, you know, that, 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 that uh, emergencies like this really test the strength of the community and, and, it, and just become stronger from it. So this was, of course, the worst thing. But, of course, if you live in the Kirob Swamp like I do, you would know. The other emergency is floods. There's flood after flood after flood in the Kirob Swamp. The 1934 was the worst one. There was um, six feet of water through the town of Kirirup. This is the old Anglican church, if you know that, and that's the railway line here, looking down Rossiter Road. And if you come sort of backwards towards me, you go to the highway. Um, and my grandparents had a house, or my, my father, my parents, grand. Grandparents had a house crew at Coral Inn, and that's where my father grew up. And family story has it there was three and a half feet of water through the house, and the family spent three nights in the roof because of the water of the of the thirty four flood, with a nine year old, a five year old, three year old, and my father who was one at the time. Who was one at the time. So you know, it was it was a uh, it made a huge difference. Kuru had a lot of floods. The swamp had a lot of floods, and it was after the nineteen thirty four flood. The people made a decision. A lot of people left the area because they just couldn't cope with the constant flooding all the time. Um, of course, the 1934 flood also affected other low-lying regions. If you see the Yarra River, like Warburton and Yarra Glen, and there was also floods at um, the Murray Creek and other creeks as well flooded. I like to think it's just a cool rough flood, but apparently it was Victoria-wide. So E is for emergencies. And, you know, 
as I said, the, the, if you have to have a good a plus side of an emergency, it's the way the community rallies together and, and survives. W, oh, this is another bit of a push, this one. W is so for weekly newspapers. <laughs> so we're very lucky here that we've had a, um, the, the social life and the history of the area has been recorded since the 1860s. Uh, the South Burke and Mornington Journal was established 1865. And it's called, uh, I talked before about land administration areas. So where the county of Mornington and where Melbourne is, it's, it's the county of Burke. And places like Danny Long are in the county of Burke. Um, so that's why it's called South Burke and Mornington Journal. And it covers, as you can see, Dandenong, Berwick, Pakenham, Brandy Creek, which is a Warrigal, uh, Grantville, Phillip Island, Woolamai, Sorrento, Templestowe, Oakley, Mordialic, et cetera. So it, it was, it extensively covered this area and it, it has a lot of information. Like we're lucky also that uh, we have Trove in Australia. If you don't know Trove, but Trove is the uh, National Library of Australia project where they've digitised lots of newspapers and they're all available on Trove. South Burke and Mornington Journal is available from uh, a 19, 1875 till the 1920s and then became the Dan Nong Journal, which is still published today. So um, it's just an amazing record of our history. The um, Packham Gazette was, has been published in the area by the Thomas family since 1909. It, started, it was started by um, the Thomas family. I can't remember who was it. Albert Thomas, I think it was. Started by Albert Thomas. Uh, in Berwick was called the Berwickshire News and became the Packham Gazette. They, they, they've since become Star News and they've actually taken over the Dan Nong Journal. So it's still run. And still, a, still a printed paper. A lot of lot of um, communities have actually lost their printed paper, and I think that's a shame. But it's the way of the world. Uh, Lang Lang Guardian started in 1902. That's the first volume one, number one, and it became the Courier of Sun. And uh, and then that closed down. That was sold. So that that was privately owned until about 1981, when it was sold to. Uh, Fairfax, so Fairfax or Murdoch. Uh, we're sold to one of those big newspaper companies. I can't remember which one it was off the top of my head, but you know, that, that also recorded. Clear up, so we, <laughs> we used to buy the Packham Gazette like all my life. We've had the Packham Gazette every week, and then I grew up at Coral Inn. And then uh, we used to occasionally get the Clear Up Sun and laugh at it because it had hopeless, like, clearly didn't ever get through Fred, but like, it, you know, I'm in. The Curie of Swamp Historical Society now, and and it, once again, it's such a great record. The local newspapers are great records of of um, not only events that happen, but also the the family information. You know, births, hatches, matches, and dispatches, as they mm -hmm. say. You know, birth notices, obituaries, wedding notices, all those things. And and if you see the old local papers from those days, from the olden days, uh, you'd always see. Um, the wedding report had the bride look beautiful, the bridesmaids are beautiful, and then and the office says. The couple received uh, received many useful and expensive presents or something. And sometimes it actually lists the presents and who gave them what. So, you know, it, it's just such an amazing resource to look at the local history of an area, newspapers. And once again, some of the um, some of these papers are on Trove. They're not all on Trove, but, yeah, they're wonderful. There was also the, um, oh, here, uh, hang on, I'm not going to go back there. The Bunyip and Garfield Express was another newspaper in the area. So we're, we're well covered by local newspapers. Why is for Yellick Creek and other waterways? This is another bit of a stretch, that one, I can tell you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. um, the first European settlement in the area always took place on creeks. And you can understand for the reason that water was required for man and beast, as they say. And of course, for the same reason, these waterways that were important to the Europeans were also important to the indigenous people in the area because they, they also needed water as well. So um, if, if, if um, so, some of the um, original Aboriginal artifacts in the area have all been found around creek beds and that's sort of the most likely place, one of the most obvious places to find them. Of course, the other place to find them would be on the coastline. They said where the Turidan Hotel was at... Um, if you know where that is, it's now a service station on the, on Sawtell's Inlet. That there used to be Midden Heap, you know, it's from the old 
pippy shells that the Aboriginals used to eat. So there was like, it was like their, their chip. And they used to have one of those at Turidan. But um, it's certainly gone now. And I think probably we haven't appreciated um, Indigenous artefacts in this area as much as what we should have. But, um, yeah. So... Um, so the first European settlements, as I said, always took place on a creek. So Captain Robert Gardner took up his pastoral lease uh, on the Cadinia Creek in 1837. And Terence O'Connor was the next year on the same creek, the Cadinia Creek. This is a part of the Cadinia Creek in 1887. Um, in 1839, Samuel Rawson and Robert Jemison, I spoke about them last week, they took up their run on the Yallock Creek. And also in the same year, 1839, the... Um, Dr. Farquhar McRae took up the run on the Umemmering Creek at uh, Umemmering. It's hard to believe now that the Umemmering Creek, which goes through Dubton, was ever the place that you'd have a pastoral run, <laughs> but it clearly was in those days. And then there's, of course, the Tumac Creek runs. Uh, IYU was taken up by William Kerr Jamison in 1838, and the Tumac run by um, two people in 1840. So you get the picture here that um, the early settlement the early runs took took place around creek, generally around creeks. The Mount Ararat station, which was sixteen thousand acres, uh, was located on the Ararat Creek, and at one stage it went from um, just east of Pakenham to just outside of Druin. I mean, that's incredibly hard to believe now as well. Um, and then, of course, for the same reason that the original squatting runs were established on a um, on a creek. Also, the original hotels were, and it's sort of no coincidence that, that the Burks actually had the Burks had the Burks Hotel. We talked about before the Latrobe Inn. They established that in 1850, but they'd already had uh, a big property it was uh, Minton's property, that which they took up I think 1847. It was quite a few thousand acres, but I think in the end they decided that they actually probably made more money from running the hotel, and in the same way, um, the uh, the Gippsland Hotel, the Bowmans. Uh, um, that was um, Janet and David Bowman. They'd actually had uh, the Panty Gangren run, and they took up the and they but they decided to uh, build the um, Cadinia Creek or the Gibson Hotel in the 1860s as well. So uh, it's it's interesting that these people who took up the squatting runs or took up the big uh, agricultural runs, and in the end, really decided to go into hotels. This is Cadinia Creek in Harkaway in the 1920s. That's really sweet. A lot of these creeks now um, have been, uh, you know, cemented over. If you see the you remember in Creek, the Dandenong Creek, they've been cemented over or covered over. And there's a new movement called daylighting. It's a daylighting movement where, where um, in fact, Melbourne Water has actually started uncovering these creeks and, and trying to bring them back to their natural state and so the Dandenong Creek is one of the creeks that they've done just to get a bit of nature back in the city and try to um, you know bring back bring back the fish and everything else that used mm. to live there and this is uh, an example of a hotel built on a river so this is David Connor's new Bunyip Inn built in um, the 1860s on the corner of the Gippsland Road and the Bunyip River so, I love this photo. They actually call it North Gippsland. I mean, it was Bunyip, it was hardly North Gippsland, but um, <laughs> interesting just the use of the term. So, that's gone. That's gone now as well. Mm. Yeah. Now, e. e is for eternal rest or cemeteries. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the Packenham Cemetery. So, we have eight cemeteries in the area. Berwick. Bunyip, Cranbourne, Jembrook, Harkaway, Lang Lang, Nangana, also called Emerald, also called Macclesfield, and Pakenham. So if you're a member of the Narrowan District Family History Group, you will know that they do lots of cemetery tours. And, and cemeteries are amazingly interesting. So, so naturally, in the early days, people were usually buried um, quickly for health reasons, and so often selected the closest burial ground. And thus you can see generations of local families in, in the same cemetery. But with the establishment of the crematorium in 1905 of the necropolis at Springvale, this provided another option for eternal rest. So people often don't, people sort of think, oh, I can't find my relative in the local cemetery. But it's always worth looking at the um, Springvale necropolis. They call it the, the Springvale Botanical Cemetery now. It's always worth looking there because a lot of people were, were, um, were cremated. So my own grandfather, 
he died in 1954. And he was cremated at Spring Vale for some reason, a little plaque there on the wall. But uh, in spite of the fact that his, um, his father and his own daughter were buried at Bunyip, they decided to, he decided to be cremated. And I presume that was just a preference of his um, at the time. And, um, and it was a modern way of thinking. So cemeteries are, of course, a great source of information for family history. And the, the other interesting thing is to see how the um, how different cultures bury their dead. If you ever go to the um, Springvale Cemetery, they've got a, like a Jewish section, they've got a, a Greek, or, an Orthodox section, they've got a Chinese section. <laughs> like people have just a, just a different graves and everything like that, and 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 it's just an uh, just, just just a fascinating social study. If you go to any cemetery, especially Pakenham, you see that, or um, other cemeteries, often um, if you look at the Anglican graves or the Catholic graves, they're often larger and more ornate than say the graves in the Methodist section and I, and I think you know different religions place more importance on, on burials and, 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 and headstones and, and also of course the rich you are the better your headstone is going to be or generally so they're you know they're an interesting study the only thing you need to know of course is that just because you see it on a headstone doesn't mean it's true so this is Christopher Moody's grave at Lang Lang so Christopher Moody was a pioneer of career up there's Moody Street in Kurup named after him and Moody's Inlet, which is uh, near, if you know, Harewood, where the Harewood or the, or the, S, or the um, aerodrome is at Turidan. It's one of those inlets down there. So he's got a, you know, quite famous in the area. And yet he's, he was died in 1920 and his headstone says 1921. So I don't know what happened there, but you can be rich and you can be famous, but still they get it wrong on your headstone. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so it's E that's is for, <laughs> what's that? It's a big mistake. I know it's a big mistake and I can't <laughs> understand why. And his wife's son buried at um, Cranbourne, which is an interesting thing. I've done, I've done a study of this because I, you may know that I do a lot about the history of Kuru Up. And, um, and if you lived on the Kuru Up Swamp, you're either buried at, depending on where you are, you'd be Packingham or Cranbourne or Lang Lang or Bunyip. So that you've got a choice of all these, Packingham, Cranbourne. Yeah. Choice, but yeah. So his wife is at Cranbourne and he's at Lang Lang. So I've said, I've said a lot about their marriage. Who knows? I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, they're not together and his grave's wrong. So, yeah. A. A is for architecture. So uh, both Gardenia and Casey, both the two shires, have undertaken heritage conservation studies. The original shire Berwick study was only 1993 and it's been updated. And the Gardenia one was 1996 and has also been updated so um, the oldest building in Casey, Virginia, I believe would probably be the Berwick Inn, the Border Hotel that we saw before that was established by Robert Bain. Um, so they, that's the oldest building. If you have to say what the most significant building is, I'd probably have to say it was Edrington, which is here at Berwick. Uh, it was um, because it was the home of Lord and Lady Casey. So City of Casey, of course, is named after Lord Casey. And... Um, Lord Casey was Governor General of Australia from September uh, 1965 to April 1969. So it's a grand mansion and it's also got these vice regal connections. So I'd say that this would be the most significant in inverted commas building. It was built for um, Samuel McKay in um, about 1906, 1907 and designed by Rodney Allsop. It's a beautiful building, and and it's part of, as you know now, it's part of the um, Edrington uh, Retirement Village. So once COVID nineteen restrictions are lifted, you can actually go and see this building, and you can hold meetings there. But it's just a wonderful building. If you look at the back, you can see views right over to Western Port, and the views from the front. It's just an most amazing building with the most beautiful garden as well, and you, and the garden's just wonderful. So. Look, uh, the, the case has got this building because um, after Sam McKay, uh, he, he had built the building. He was a pastoralist in Western Australia. And then, it, then the Churnsides bought it. So Andrew and his wife, Winifred. So um, the Churns, they're connected, of course, to the Churnsides who uh, built Werribee, Manch, Werribee Park Mansion. And, and um, the Churnsides purchased the property in 1912 and they called it Edrington after a family property in Scotland. They had no children, a Andrew and Winifred, and Winifred Churnside was Lady Casey's auntie. And then they both died within three months of each other in 1934. And it was actually Winifred Churnside's um, 
nieces and nephews who inherited the property, not the Churnside nieces and nephews. So I don't know whether that was ever a, um, a bone of contention in the family or whether um, the Churnside thought, well, we have enough fancy properties. We don't need this one. Who knows? But anyway, I just found that interesting. And talking about significant buildings, there are a few unappreciated gems in the area. And, and this is actually the Fountain Gate housing estate. It was um, developed by Isidore Majid in the mid-1960s. And he employed Robert, Robin Boyd to create this estate on um, Radburn principles. On Radburn principles. Hang on, hang on. I'll be at least 15 minutes here. Yeah. On Radburn principles, which was um, um, designed to um, provide, as you can see from the plan here, it had uh, short cul-de-sac uh, entries and internal spines of open space. So you can see here, this was supposed to be open space and there were no fences. So that was the whole principle of the design of the, um, of the Fountain Gate estate. I believe apparently in reality that once people uh, built the house, they actually wanted to put fences up. And, you know, it's interesting that architects sometimes come up with all these um, grand plans, but uh, the actual reality of living there is quite different. But uh, there was also a few significant houses in there. This one here is built, I think it was Barry Simon, the local MP. His house was designed by Robin Boyd and other architects such as um, Roy Grounds, who designed the um, National Gallery. Uh, and I uh, had a list of others, but I can't find them. It doesn't really matter. So there were other, um, other um, famous architects, but they do have some protection under the City of Casey Heritage Scheme. But I think that people who live there don't appreciate the value. And I think this is an issue with a lot of, um, if you see the kerfuffle with mid-century modern houses around, um, you know, the Bo Morris area, those sort of areas that, um, that people just don't appreciate the architectural value of them. And this should be protected at all costs. So that is another significant house, a lot less grand, of course, than Edrington in the area. And we're nearly finished here. So Happy New Year. R is for retail or shopping. If you're under 35, unless you're under 35, I don't need to tell you how shopping has changed over the years. From the mid-1850s, when our towns began to develop, the shop sprung up along High Street or the Main Street. A general store, a blacksmith, a baker, a butcher would be some of the earliest stores. Later on, there'd be other uh, things like a bootmaker, a greengrocer, a hairdresser, and perhaps a confectionery shop, which I know sounds fanciful. But from in the, in the 1910s, both Garfield and Bunyip had a confectionery shop, which I found really amazing. They had tobacconists, they had dress shops, um, grocery stores, banks, etc. And this strip shopping like you see here, Main Street Packing, was how people shopped until the development of the big shopping centres. So the first one in the area was Cranbourne Park Shopping Centre, which opened November the 14th, 1978. Um, Endeavour Hill Shopping Centre, 1979, and Fountain Gate Shopping Centre opened March 1980. Um, in, the, in the matter of um, Packenham, um, the first major shops off the Main Street were in around 1984 when, when uh, Safeways was built sort of behind the main street and if you want in, in my mind the beginning of an end of a country town is when is when the, is when the shops move off the main street to another shopping center I, I think it's I understand why people want all of that but I think it's a shame I just think that the whole idea of um when people no longer do their shopping at the small independently owned businesses in main street and they go to the big shopping center in my mind that's the beginning of the end of a country town so but that's the way it is even though you do wonder though now with, um, of course, shopping's changed again with um, online shopping. And we found out during COVID-19 that, you know, you just have to do shopping in a different way. However, I'm going to finish now with my, one of my favourite photos of, of a um, strip shopping centre, which is, of course, High Street Cranbourne in the 1960s. I love this photo. I put up on, on Casey Kedinia Facebook page quite frequently because it's got the Holden car, it's got whatever this is, a Morris, I think. And it's got the dog. If you just want a quintessential Australian country town, it would have to be a photo of a Holden car and a dog. And this is Cranbourne in the High Street, 1960s. It's just an amazing photo. And you know, if you know, you know Cranbourne, you know how much this has changed. So we no longer shop in the, well, we do do a bit of shopping in these Main Street shopping centres, but 
basically, even Cranbourne, it wants, everything's moved to those to the big new um, Centro Shopping Centre. So that that is Happy New Year, and that's the end. So Happy New Year! Thanks for listening, and um, yeah, thanks for listening. It's been fun. I, I love the I love this. I love this eclectic. She says rather modestly, but I just love it. <laughs> I just love it. I just love all the, you know, just a different variety of our history. So happy new year, everyone. Mm-hmm.